Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome this afternoon Professor Rob Stevens, who joins us uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School, where he is the Albert Pratt Professor of Business and Government. Uh, he is also the director of the Harvard Environmental Economics Program, and he directs the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements. Anyone who knows Rob is aware that he brings an economic rigor to understanding the causes and the consequences of environmental problems. And he brings this rigor also to the task of designing solutions that are, in his words, effective, sensible, and politically feasible. Today, Rob applies an economics lens to discuss the future of the Paris Climate Agreement, which was reached in December of 2015 and has now been signed by 177 parties since it was first opened for signature on Earth Day, April 22nd, 2016. While reaching the Paris Agreement was not easy, the hard work has really only just begun. And Rob will describe the new approach to global action that the Paris Agreement represents and discuss the role of carbon pricing as well as the potential for linking policies across nations in its implementation. I'm particularly eager to hear his thoughts on the institutional path ahead, as well as the role of the scholarly community, that's us here in this room, in supporting this process. Rob also pens a blog entitled An Economic View of the Environment, which I highly recommend to all of you, um, if you're interested in reading more. Uh, for now, uh, it's my great pleasure to turn the floor over to Rob Stevens. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Valerie, for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm particularly delighted to be at MIT talking on this topic of global climate change because, as many of you know, because you're doing it, uh, MIT has been a world leader on research on global climate change, ranging from atmospheric chemistry to economics and virtually everything in between. So it's, it's a privilege to be here talking about uh, this subject. As you can see, I, I've titled uh, my comments today, um, What Can an Economist Possibly Have to Say About uh, Climate Change? And so, because I think that this is an, not an audience, I assume, of all economists. And so, it's particularly if you come from the natural sciences or you just walked off the street in Cambridge, you could quite reasonably ask that question, what can an economist possibly have to say about this? And so, I want to try to motivate that uh, by starting with a story. So I was uh, flying out of Logan Airport uh, a while back, and I sat down in my seat, and as I sat down, I got out some papers, my iPad, a book, and I began to delve into them. But be long before we took off, it became apparent that the gentleman who was seated next to me uh, wanted to have a conversation. Um, because maybe you've noticed what I have, there tend to be two kinds of people who fly, uh, those who like to have conversations with perfect strangers, and then the rest of us. So I'm very much in that second uh, category. But he was determined. He was as determined to have a conversation as I was determined not to have one. And he sought to start out the conversation the way Americans often do. Uh, he asked me, what business am I in? You know, what, do I, what did I do for a living? And when he asked me that, uh, I did something foolish. I told the truth. And I said, I'm an environmental economist. And he looked at me. And I looked at him. He didn't follow up with a comment or a, another question. And certainly, I wasn't going to follow up because I didn't want to talk in the first place. And so we essentially looked into each other's eyes for what seemed to me to be an interminably long time until it dawned upon me that the reason this fellow so much want, who wanted to talk was not following up with conversation was that he had concluded that he had just met a living, breathing oxymoron an internal contradiction. After all, it's either the environment or the economy. It's either the study of environmental science or the study of economics. 
So the initial point that I want to share with you, and I hope I will persuade you of by the time that I finish, is that environmental economics is not oxymoronic. And I say this for two principal reasons. The first is that in a market economy such as we have in the United States and as exists now in the vast majority of countries in the world, in fact, all but a handful of countries in the world, in such countries, the cause of environmental problems are economic. They're an unintended consequence of market activity. They're a consequence of highly desirable, highly meritorious activity of producers producing goods and services that you and I as consumers want, and they're a consequence of consumers, in some cases, using those self-same products. But either in producing the products or in consuming the products, there are these negative side effects, which because they're external to the decision making of the firm, because they're external to the decision making of consumers, economists refer to these as externalities, which is one of a half dozen types of so-called market failure, which economists study. In fact, sometimes non-economists seem to think that what economists focus on are, are the perfections of the market. And on the contrary, what economists in universities, at least microeconomists, like myself, tend to focus on are the imperfections, the market failures. In fact, someone told, said to me a few weeks ago that the institution I'm in, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, could be called the Kennedy School of Market Failure because that's what we study, whether it's externalities, public goods, monopoly problems, information problems. So that's the first reason why environmental economics is of consequence, or economics is for environmental issues, because the causes are economic. The second is that the consequences of environmental problems have very important economic dimensions. So surely if the causes are economic and the consequences have economic dimensions, then an economic perspective can be useful. In fact, I'll, I'll argue that it is essential for a full understanding of environmental problems. But that's not enough. The reason why I care about a full understanding of environmental problems is because that is exceptionally helpful, indeed necessary, for the design of solutions that have three characteristics. One, they're effective. And by effective, I mean they actually do something about the problem, as opposed to being only of symbolic value and making some of us feel good, but not actually bringing about change. So that's what I mean by effective. That they're economically sensible, by which I mean we're not sacrificing more than we need to to get that environmental protection, sacrificing more than we need to in terms of the other things that we care about, which is a reasonably priced food supply, fuels to warm us and allow us to drive our cars, health care, education, and everything else. And then finally, because of the fact that they can be less costly, there is at least a possibility then we can design solutions that are more likely to be politically pragmatic. Because what all of this is going to come down to, as you'll see from my perspective, is essentially politics. Now, economic thinking like this is particularly important for the formulation of effective, sensible, and politically feasible policies when we move into the dimension of climate change. And so I think a convenient way to think about this is a chain that starts with natural science, that goes to economics, and that that takes us to the geopolitics of climate change, and therefore to the importance of international cooperation and agreement. So the fundamental science, and you'll forgive me for all the scientists and the knowledgeable people in the audience, but so that we're on a common denominator, the fundamental key scientific fact that affects so much the economics and the geopolitics is that greenhouse gases mix in the atmosphere. It doesn't matter whether some unit of emissions came from Cambridge, Beijing, Calcutta, or London, they're going to have essentially the same effect on the global climate. It doesn't mean certainly that climate impacts are the same everywhere around the world. They're not. They're not equally, will not be equally distributed. But it does mean the location of emissions has no effect on impacts, which is simply a definition, therefore, of a global commons problem in economic terms or in political science terms as well, for that matter. But that means something very important, because that means that any individual jurisdiction that takes action, whether it's a 
region like Europe, a country such as Korea, or a state such as California, that that jurisdiction is going to incur the costs of its actions, and the costs might be switching from coal to petroleum to natural gas to renewables, greater degrees of energy efficiency and the like. They'll incur the direct costs of their actions, but the direct climate benefits are going to be distributed globally. And that says something very important. It says that for virtually any jurisdiction, the direct climate benefits that that jurisdiction receives as a result of the actions it takes will be less than the cost it incurs, even though globally the benefits are greater than the cost, indeed quite possibly vastly greater than the cost. That's again another way of defining a global commons problem, and that's what brings about this very classic free rider problem, namely that it is in the interest of each jurisdiction to benefit from the actions of others but not to incur costs oneself. So contrast that, if you will, with a localized air pollution problem, a localized water pollution problem. The state of California takes on the costs for having very ambitious air regulations, and they also reap the benefits of those air regulations. It's even true on a non-global scale, but a regional scale, for transboundary air pollutants, such as what we used to refer to as acid rain. But because this is a global free rider issue, it tells us that international, not necessarily global, not all countries, but international cooperation is essential. And that's basically the, the premise for my work in this area and for what I'm going to share with you now. So I'm going to provide a very brief history of the international climate negotiations, frankly because if you start with Paris, then you're, we're going to be suffering from you know, that cliche of making the perfect the enemy of the good. When you review the history that led up to this, you're going to realize how good the good is. And so I want to take it in that context. I am going to comment, I promise you, on the limitations and the challenges of Paris going forward. So it started with the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. This was the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. Given that it was about environment and development, you might think it would have focused and produced agreements on the two big environmental problems facing developing countries then, which were then and certainly and now, uh, indoor air pollution from using biomass for cooking fires in kitchens and for heating without adequate ventilation, which will kill 10 to 15 million people next year, largely women and children who are in those kitchens in developing countries. Or you might think it would have, it would have focused on lack of potable water supplies, surface water pollution. That leads to chronic dysentery. And again, that doesn't affect healthy people that ingest the water for a short time. They recover. But small children and those who are predisposed to other illness then results in mortality. And we're, again, we're talking about 10 to 15 million people, according to the World Health Organization. Those were the interests of the developing countries, but that, those are not the conventions that came out of uh, the UN. What came out of it were two international agreements, if you will, two conventions that are umbrellas for subsequent agreements, and they focused on the, prob the concerns of the North. So the industrialized countries successfully captured it. Uh, including environmental advocacy groups, for which I used to work for one full time. Uh, and what came out of it were two conventions, one on biodiversity, a big concern of the North, and certainly not a focus of developing countries when they were trying to develop. Their view of a focus on biodiversity sounded like the United States saying to them, to Brazil, for example, in the United States, we've enjoyed our economic development. We tore down all that forest, converted forest and grassland to agricultural land for a food supply for our population in the 18th and 19th century. Sorry, you're not going to do that because we'd like you to preserve the Amazon because we care about the endangered species that are there. The other convention that came out of it was the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, which was just beginning to be, only beginning to be, a major concern, but again, in the mainly industrialized countries. I tell you that because there's going to be an important difference as we go forward on the perspective of the industrialized countries compared to the developing countries on climate change. And it's, it's to some degree, a quite understandable difference in perspective. Now, the United Nations Convention has two, I'd say, two fundamental elements. One, it said that countries of the world 
uh, are in this together and they should reduce an uh, anthropogenic emissions to the point where they were no longer cause serious damages. Now that's not very well defined, either scientifically, certainly not economically, but it was saying we're gonna do something about it. The other part that was very important was a statement about distributional equity, which was, yes, we're all in it together, it's a global commons problem, but some countries have greater responsibility than others because, as you know, damages from greenhouse gases are not a function of the emissions at a point in time, but of the accumulated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. CO2 has a lag time on the order of 100 years before it precipitates out or, or through other chemical reactions. And it's the stock that matters. And by definition, the accumulated stock is, of course, due to the process of industrial, industrialization and hence largely the industrialized countries that the fra full phrase is common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And that referred to the fact that some countries were wealthier than others and had more ability to do something about it. Now that principle, which is fundamental, and I'm gonna to refer to it as the cognoscenti do in this area, CBDR, the abbreviation, um, that principle is a sound principle, it seems to me, of distributional e equity. I'm not an ethicist or a philosopher, but it strikes me as an economist anyway, as a sound principle to be thinking about in terms of distributional equity. There are lots of ways in which that principle could be operationalized in international agreements. But at the very first conference of the parties that took place in Berlin in 1995, and the conference that just took place in Paris in December of 2015 was the 21st annual conference of the parties. So at the very first decision that came out of the first conference of the parties, was what has come to be referred to as the Berlin Mandate. And this was a very specific interpretation of CBDR, namely that one set of countries who were listed in an appendix and therefore referred to as the Annex I countries should commit to targets to reduce emissions, but there would be no commitments for other countries. Now, who were the Annex I countries? They were essentially the OECD countries at the time, the, in, the set of industrialized countries plus a few others uh, quickly opted into that. That approach, that dichotomous distinction, was fundamental and then that was codified two years later at the third conference of the parties in Kyoto, Japan, in the Kyoto Protocol, which set up quantitative targets for the Annex I countries only. Now, I don't, I don't think I'll go to the blackboard. If I were to draw, or if I had here, and I apologize, I don't, a bar graph of per capita income of 195 countries in the world, you, you could probably picture that it would look like. It would look something like a log normal uh, distribution that's, you know, that's unimodal, and it's gonna start Wait, that, let's put it hitting the vertical axis, and then it's coming down, and at first you've got the, the richest countries in the world per capita, which are gonna be some European countries, the United States, the Gulf oil states, Singapore, et cetera, and it's coming down slowly, and there's gonna be a long tail that's very small of the poorest countries in the world in sub-Saharan Africa. It's gonna be a continuous distribution is what you would see. You wouldn't see a step function of the OECD countries, they're all the same, and all the non-OECD countries, they're all the same. Of course, it's not that way. So this was a very specific interpretation of what I said was a reasonable principle of distributional equity. That brings forth the challenges. First of all, the Annex I countries on their own can't reduce global emissions because there essentially is not growth in the Annex I countries. It's up and down each year, but by and large, the Annex I countries, the richest industrialized countries of the world, have emissions that are flat to declining. In some cases, it's because of public policies, such as in Europe, but overall, it's a result of the fact that energy comes at a price, even without policies, and so economies have been becoming more energy efficient, less energy intensive, hence less carbon intensive over time. The growth in emissions is coming from the large emerging economies, and we applaud their e economic growth as they come out of poverty and they join the other countries of the world, and that's China and India and Brazil and Korea and South Africa and Mexico, and if we include deforestation impacts on, on CO2, then we'll include Indonesia in that. But they weren't, that's where the growth in emissions is. So this approach can't do anything about, uh, about the growth in emissions. Furthermore, even if it was a good principle of distributional equity at the beginning, this dichotomous distinction, which it was not in my view, by the time that Kyoto came into force in 2008, 50 non-NX1 countries 
at higher per capita, per capita income than the poorest of the Annex I countries. So it's not just the Singapore's and the Gulf oil states and Israel and a small set of countries that are wealthy that were left out. It's 50 countries have higher per capita income than the poorest of the Annex I countries, which of course are found in Eastern Europe, and I think it's Romania now probably. Third and most important perhaps is that this dichotomous distinction with no graduation mechanism made progress impossible because the incentive, if I was hired as a consultant to a non-Annex I country, what would be my advice for negotiation strategies? Do everything you can to keep this in place and don't take on commitments. That's going to be the approach and that was very much the approach for a long time. Now things began to improve. I'm going to be less depressing now as I move forward. Uh, in Bali, this was the 13th conference of the parties, was the first time that we saw a structure for, annex, for actions by non-Annex I countries in ways that I'm not going to take time to talk about. That accelerated then the, in the subsequent two meetings in Copenhagen and in Cancun, which began to blur the distinction between Annex I and non-Annex I. There were still only targets for the Annex I countries, but the distinction began to blur in terms of the language and in terms of various aspects of those two agreements. The real change came in Durban, South Africa in 2011, when among other things, the delegates agreed by vote to a, a mandate to adopt worldwide by 2015 in Paris, that was to adopt by the uh, COP, the Conference of the Parties this year, a new legal framework that would include all countries under one legal framework for implementation in 2020. That broke with the Berlin mandate. And at a minimum, it signaled a new opening for innovative thinking because suddenly the countries of the world, many of the delegations had to think about, well, what's the structure going to be? We have not overthrown CBDR. It's all still under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, so we still have to include in our thinking that principle of distributional equity, but now everyone's going to be under it. It's not going to be a dichotomous distinction. And that opening for innovative thinking, of course, was wonderful for academics, since we like to think that's what we do for a living. And we took it very seriously at the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements about, I'll say just a word, if for no other reason, so you can discount what I'm saying, you know where much of this is coming from. So this is a project that's been going on now for close to a decade, a worldwide project, and our mission is to help the negotiating countries uh, identify the key design elements of a scientifically sound, economically sensible, and politically pragmatic international policy architecture, essentially for the post-Kyoto uh, regime. Um, although it's called the Harvard Project, it's by no means only people from Harvard. In fact, we have a number of faculty members at MIT who have been engaged in research with us. But it includes from academia, economists, political scientists, uh, legal scholars and experts in international relations, also people from private industry who have expertise, NGOs who have expertise, and of course governments. And we have 75 research initiatives, probably only 10 or 15 are at Harvard, the others are at other institutions around the world, importantly including China and India, but also these other countries that you can see. And we're very engaged, sort of as quintessential Kennedy School, that we don't just do research, but we're very engaged in implementation, recognizing that that implementation is a two-way street. It's not taking the wisdom from the academic world to the operational world of policymakers, but also learning from the policymakers and bringing that back to inform the research that's going on. So as I'll, as I'll show you later, I'll mention a word about what we were involved in in Paris. But for the time being before that, I'm going to put aside uh, the discussion about the Harvard Project completely and look at what was going on leading up to Paris. So the framework for Paris, remember, comes from this Durban Platform for Enhanced Action that everyone's going to be under a single, uh, a single legal agreement. And the structure that emerged, which I'm proud to say we had proposed uh, in uh, 2013, I think that is, we started working on that in 2011, uh, was what has now come to be called a hybrid international policy architecture that has bottom-up elements and top-down elements. And to explain what, this, what I mean by that, let me say that in the Kyoto Protocol context, it's all top-down. So when we got together for our negotiations, 
we negotiated such that I was negotiating about what you should do in your country, what your target should be, and you were negotiating about what my target should be. That's top down. So all the numerical targets were negotiated in, in plenary, essentially, from top down. The way it works here is that there are some top-down elements for oversight, guidance, and coordination. Those are negotiated. But the numbers that are in there are from a bottom-up process of what were called intended nationally determined contributions. I apologize. I'm going to refer to those as INDCs as I go forward. And those are targets and actions that weren't negotiated, but rather that what I decided I can do. So rather than getting involved in a negotiation, I have a numerical target, then I go home to my country to try to get it ratified and try to get it through the legislature to get uh, policies that can achieve it. It starts with those policies. It starts with the domestic knowledge of what is achievable, plus a little kick additional to that in most cases for aspiration. That becomes the basis. And I'll show you the numbers for the United States on this, where it comes from. So those are the nationally determined contributions. The idea is that they're consistent with national policies and goals. After I give you the good news, I'll show you, of course, what the concern is about that approach. Great challenges remained, but something that should not pass without being stated is that there were two very important moments, I think probably the most important moments in 20 years of climate negotiations that I've been engaged in. And that was in November of 2014 in Beijing and September 2015 in Washington, D.C., when the two heads of state of the two largest emitters, China and the United States, made joint announcements of what essentially of what their INDCs would be, that they were getting out in front of the process, here's what we're going to do. And in both cases, they were beyond what people had anticipated. So it was quite uh, impressive in both cases. And I can tell you, when I was at the talks in Lima, which were one year before the Paris talks, so December 2014, whenever difficult issues came up and it looks like the talks were going to break down, there was a wind that was pushing at the backs of the delegations. And that wind was the, the, the knowledge that all the delegations had of China and the United States, the two largest emitters, together accounting for now about 40% of global emissions, that they were on board. They were doing it. And that became exceptionally Im important. Now, in order to assess the, the Paris Agreement, uh, I'm going to give you what I called my pre-Paris scorecard. Um, you kindly mentioned my blog. So at my blog on November 17th, before the uh, initiation of the talks in Paris, um, I wrote a brief essay in which I listed for people, I was thinking of the press really, uh, how they'll know whether Paris is a success. And this was because of the fact that I recognized, actually starting in a meeting at MIT that Jake Jacoby hosted, I don't think Jake is here, uh, about two years earlier that you participated in, this notion that the press, what they were going to be thinking of was this two degree target, 450 parts per million and nothing else, and would judge success or failure that way. And at that moment, at the, after I left that conference, it became my task. Every time I talked to a member of the press, I always got in a comment of what was the right way to judge it. And so I wrote it up in 2015, and here's what I said in November. First of all, and these are, each of these are necessary, none of them are sufficient conditions. Uh, include countries accounting for approximately 90% of global emissions in the submitted INDCs. That would contrast with the 14% that are covered by the current commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, which is essentially Europe and New Zealand. Because the United States didn't ratify, Russia dropped out, Japan dropped out, Australia dropped out and Canada dropped out. So what's left is 14% of uh, global emissions. So that's the first, 90% of global emissions in terms of the scope of participation. Second, establish credible reporting and transparency requirements, uh, whether the monitoring and reporting is done at the national level uh, or, or at the international level. Third, continue work on something that goes back to uh, Hillary Clinton's statement in Copenhagen. Uh, which is that the richer countries of the world would come up with a fund of $100 billion per year uh, by the year 2020, f essentially for purposes of adaptation and mitigation activities in the poorer countries of the world. 
Now, it's no longer sort of the richer versus the poorer. In fact, it's very important to take note of the fact and give credit where it's due. China has voluntarily become a donor country rather than a recipient country with regards to the fund, although they're doing it through institutionally a separate fund. But nevertheless, they've moved from one side to the other. Fourth, agree to return to the negotiations periodically. I had suggested every five years to revisit the, amb the ambition and, for that matter, the structure of the INDCs, compare them to goals, and then presumably with ratcheting up. And then to put aside some very unproductive disagreements, there were two. One of them is referred to as loss and damage. What this refers to is the fact that even if we reduce emissions to zero tomorrow morning, global emissions to zero, there will still be climate change because of the accumulated anthropogenic greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we won't see uh, and will continue to see those impacts for 100 years or so. So the perspective then of the most vulnerable countries in the world is, well, and when I say that, I'm referring to small island states that don't just lose 2% of their gross domestic product, as many countries would with fairly severe climate change, but re essentially lose their country. I'm also thinking of sub-Saharan uh, economies in Africa that are already very poor, subject to drought, and then also thinking about sea level rise in South Asia and what that would mean for millions upon millions of square miles of uh, otherwise arable land and societies. So their view was, well, We've got to, there's got to be something for our losses to pay for the damages that we're getting. So for them, it was absolutely essential. When the wealthier countries of the world looked at this, what they saw instead was the possibility of it leading to unlimited legal liability for bad weather in other parts of the world. After all, we cannot distinguish between that hurricane, that tragic hurricane in Philippines that might have happened anyway, and the fact that the intensity and or the frequency of hurricanes is affected by climate change. So you can picture that this was sort of an un on the one set of countries absolutely have to have it, the other set of countries cannot abide by it, and that's why I said is that trying to include that could lead to the, the negotiations blowing up. The other one was the insistence by some countries, in particular France, um, that the INDC numbers themselves, that remember are voluntarily stated by each country, that these numbers themselves should be binding under international law. But making those binding under international law, even if they were self-stated, would have at a minimum required one thing to happen, and that would be ratification of the agreement by the United States Senate, which wouldn't happen. Kyoto was not ratified. The Bird Hagel resolution leading up to Kyoto uh, that opposed that approach and said they wouldn't ratify it, the vote was 95 to nothing, okay? including all the liberal Democrats, including the, the late Senator Kennedy and, uh, and Secretary Kerry. So there is completely bipartisan opposition to that kind of approach, and that's why we didn't get uh, ratification here. So that would have meant, if you had that in there, that the U.S. wouldn't participate. The U.S. doesn't participate. There goes the cooperation with China. China doesn't participate. Now you've lost 40% of the emissions. A lot of the smaller countries don't participate. And what are you back to? We're back to the 14% or even less. We're back to essentially Europe, uh, perhaps going it alone for their own reasons. So I thought it was futile to pursue such unproductive elements. So that's November 2015. Let's see what happened a month later. I'm going to take you through the elements of the Paris Agreement, because it's only 12 pages long, the core of it itself. And I'm just hitting some of the highlights. Now, you'll notice that the first highlight is one that was not on my list. And this is the aspirational target of limiting war warming to 2 degrees centigrade, which actually is itself a problematic statement. It would be better to say to 450 parts per million because the uncertainty between the concentrations and the temperature impacts are very great. But there is an aspirational target in there. It's reaffirmed of two degrees and even more aspirational. It says maybe we should go to one and a half degrees uh, centigrade. My perspective is the following. That target, which is now politically accepted and is endorsed by every scientist that I've discussed it with, every natural scientist, does not come from science. It didn't come from the IPCC. It came from a political process, and there's a nice paper that traces where it come, came from. It's certainly not based on the economics. It's not a notion of what would be the efficient time path or, or the efficient maximum. Uh, and to me, it's less important than the critical components of the agreement. 
So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, you know, I spent most of my career before getting into climate change, maybe 15 years ago, working on US environmental policies. And we have five major environmental statutes in the United States. And I'll take one of them as an example, the Clean Water Act. So the Clean Water Act, going back to 1972, has a preamble, an aspirational pre uh, preamble, and it says, we, the Congress, intend that all waters in America be fishable and swimmable in five years. That's a lovely statement. Okay? It didn't happen, and it didn't matter that they said it. What mattered was not that paragraph. What mattered was the 475 pages that followed that had specific elements of public policy, specific mechanisms and instruments to reduce water pollution. That's what mattered. And excessive attention to that preamble could have paralyzed the process. So that's my feeling about the aspirational limit. That's why I did not include it as a necessary condition. I'm not opposed to the fact that they have it in because it is politically now endorsed. It is official. Um, but I, I don't see it as an important uh, part. I mean, you, some of you will make arguments that that, uh, that kind of goal helps to motivate. That kind of a goal can also do precisely the opposite. It convince people we're never going to do that, and then they throw up their hands and don't want to do incremental improvements. Getting to the more positive, what is in there is broad scope of participation. Um, these INDCs were submitted by the end of Paris to, by 187 countries, together representing 96% of global CO2 emissions. Remember, that's, compare that with the 14% under Kyoto. And there's a provision to revise them, essentially, every five years through a specific process that is laid out of stock taking and the like. There are transparency requirements. These are focused on domestic monitoring, reporting, and verification, uh, which is where it is really binding. And uh, there, this is the one place in the agreement, to my mind, where there are still substantial differences between, not, they're not called Annex 1, non-Annex 1, they're called now developed and developing, but between those two sets of countries because the transparency requirements are less stringent for the developing countries, but it says there will be convergence over time, although it doesn't have a year, a time for that to happen. Uh, there's provision for something very important that if I have time I'll talk about uh, because it's important and we've been working on it a lot, and that's uh, uh, linkage. So let me explain what I mean by this very uh, quickly. So different countries taking on different targets, having different sources of fuels, having different economic conditions, are going to wind up facing very different incremental costs, or what economists call marginal cost. It's going to be very different in different countries. We know for a fact, a basic principle, we know that if the marginal cost in two different jurisdictions is different, then we know we could accomplish the same amount in total more cheaply by having the high cost controller shed some of the responsibility and the low cost controller take on that added responsibility until the point that they're at the same marginal cost. That's the necessary condition, the first order condition for uh, cost effectiveness. International policy linkage means that different countries can get credit towards their INDCs by financing or otherwise facilitating actions in some other jurisdiction where there might be low-hanging fruit, essentially, that brings down costs, but you would still be getting the same amount of coverage. Now, for reasons, well, maybe I'll just tell you now, there are a set of, you might think the way I described it, well, this sounds like motherhood and apple pie, surely it would be in there. There are a set of countries who are very opposed to what I've said and have, and have played a very important part in the negotiations. These are the ALBA countries, the, the acronym coming from the Bolivarian Alliance, largely, uh, essentially, I should say, the Latin American socialist countries of Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, El Salvador, et cetera, who are opposed to the world economic order. And I'm not even going to comment on that because it's over my pay grade. I'm not a macroeconomist. But they're opposed to the world economic order. And they raise those objections in every international symposium possible, including on climate change. So there's, uh, there is great opposition from them to the notion of linkage because that can need, mean markets. What we have instead, without any use of the word market, so if you do control F in the uh, looking at the uh, PDF file of the Paris Agreement, you won't find the word market. But you'll find cumbersome long sentences that say, if a situation arises in one country uh, having higher costs, another country having lower costs, wish to engage in an exchange or a transfer, then they can do that. Because it's not a market. 
So the market was kept out, and instead we have this horrible phrase, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, or ITMOs. And this is important because it can greatly reduce cost and facilitates partial convergence. I say possible, but it's also partial convergence to a single global carbon price, which would mean action at the lowest possible cost, which means therefore greater ambition, at least equal or greater ambition. Uh, next, there is the global finance mechanism. Uh, there's a recommitment to the 100 billion, and they state that in the year 2025, that will be treated as a floor, not as a ceiling. The numbers are not in the agreement. They're in accompanying what's called a decision, which has somewhat less uh, standing. That loss and damage, I told you what a highly contentious issue that was. It was successfully finessed. It's in, it's in the agreement, the loss and damage, but in the decision, it says that the parties agree, so everyone signed off on this, the parties agree that, quote, this does not involve or provide a basis for any liability or compensation. So that was finessed. But the loss and damage discussion remains in the agreement, largely under the rubric of adaptation financing. In terms of legally binding, the agreement comes into force when at least 55 countries uh, that account for at least 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions have approved it. Um, the individual, so that's the part that's legally, that it then becomes legally binding, but the individual numbers of the INDCs are in a public registry which is separate from that. So is this success? Well, given my pre-Paris scorecard, everything was hit. Um, so I have to say that the Paris climate talks were a success. Whether the agreement itself will ultimately be successful in bringing down emissions is something that I don't know and no one in this room knows, no one in the world knows, because that's going to be decades before it can be assessed. It's going to depend upon political will, the nature of policy instruments, the nature of economic development in, in basically about 20 countries of the world, but to some degree for all 195 uh, in the world. So let me, I'm going to tr eliminate some of this. Uh, so, well, so the key challenge, I should say, it's probably obvious to you. The, the key challenge is with this bottom-up structure that essentially the INTCs are anchored in domestic politics, is there going to be sufficient ambition? And there are, that's something we're working on tremendously now going forward in the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements. But one aspect of the answer to that is linkage, because linkage brings down costs for everyone, it brings countries together interacting, and it can lead to a virtuous cycle rather than a, a vicious cycle of action. Uh, cap and trade has emerged uh, throughout the world, but national policies are going to be heterogeneous. Uh, there, are, there are cap and trade systems, but there are also carbon taxes in a number of countries of the world. A lot of jur other jurisdictions won't use carbon pricing at all. They'll use performance standards or technology standards. And the important thing is that uh, the Paris Agreement provides for this. So going back two years before Paris, we had begun to do work on what needed to be in the Paris Agreement to facilitate effective uh, linkage. This is a combination of uh, a legal scholar, a law student, and two economists. Uh, and we said the, main th the first thing you have to do is do no harm. So don't allow in a statement that says, all achievements have to be within a country's borders, because that kills carbon markets, it kills cooperation. And to be positive, simply a statement that countries can achieve parts of their INDCs by financing or otherwise facilitating actions in other jurisdictions. And I'm very proud to say, I'm pleased to say that we became involved in that uh, in Paris. Um, and because of uh, two countries, who I won't name since this is being recorded, uh, two countries, uh, but I can say neither of which was the United States, but two very important countries who were negotiating brought us in and the problematic language got out and the provision of what's needed got in, and that's Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So let me finish with the institutional, I think I'm going to skip if you'll forgive me, I'm going to skip talking about national policies. My example was the U.S. of the great challenges. We can come back to that if there's a question. We'll just talk about it. So let me finish up by saying something about the institutional uh, path ahead. Uh, um, many people would say that Copenhagen, which sort of collapsed in some ways, illustrated a problem with the United Nations 
because there's no voting, a voting rule was never adopted in the UNFCCC, and therefore they use the default voting rule of the General Assembly, which is consensus. And that had been treated as unanimity. And that's a prescription for not getting anything done, looking for unanimity, particularly when you had these five ALBA countries who we know will always object at the end. Um, and that's what kept the Copenhagen uh, Accords from being adopted. They were simply noted. Fortunately, to illustrate the fact that contrary to what academics like myself think, it's, it's not just the structure, it's not just the institutions, it's really the people often, you know, who's there. You know, like your colleague Ernie being in, in Washington, the people really matter. And unlike in Copenhagen when Prime Minister Rasmussen capitulated at the end and so they didn't adopt anything, uh, in, one year later in Cancun, Patricia Espinosa, who was the very talented, really smart uh, foreign minister and was the presiding officer at the end, same five countries stand up, they object, they said because of undemocratic procedures, which is quite ironic considering who those countries are, but anyway. So they objected on the basis of undemocratic procedures and she simply says, I recognize your objection, we really appreciate it. Consensus does not require unanimity and she takes her gavel, puts her gavel down and says it's adopted. And everyone stood and applauded except for five countries. That then became going forward and still remains the norm. That's now become the political norm, is that consensus doesn't require unanimity. But people have said it's a problem so many countries. There are some other approaches going forward. There is an approach initiated by the United States, actually by the George W. Bush administration, taken on by the Obama administration, bringing just the major parties together, 20 parties, one of which is the EU. So 20 parties that account for 90% of global emissions. Figure you can get a lot more agreement there more easily and then take it to plenary. Problem is it's a US creature. Um, but the G20, the finance ministers of the 20 largest economies is quite similar. There are a few countries in, a few countries out. And then finally, multilateral and bilaterals, the most important of which of course is uh, China. Uh, lastly, I should comment on uh, one other possibility going forward, which has gotten a lot of attention lately in the academic world anyway, which are uh, climate clubs, so-called. So a club has a very specific definition in economics and political science, which perhaps is also to some degree the common sense definition. And that is a club is a group of individuals, firms or institutions or countries, whatever, who get together and they share a benefit that they don't let anyone else have that's not a member of the club. So in other words, you can't play golf if you don't belong to the country club, right? They're gonna keep you off. And this notion of club can potentially apply in climate change outside of even the UNFCCC. So two approaches have been examined, a club of national carbon taxes uh, by David Victor, who's an MIT PhD in political science, now out in San Diego, a fantastic scholar in this area, and most recently by Bill Nordhaus, an, an economist at Yale, but also carbon market, what I'll call coalitions, but really of cap and trade, uh, Nat Cohane, my former PhD student, uh, who's at the Environmental Defense Fund, has worked on that most recently. So there are lots of benefits of these clubs. Uh, the most important one is building up participation. That's the whole idea. However, what's important is that it's by, the only way you get the participation is providing this exclusive benefit. And the one benefit that turns out to be actually credible numerically is a uniform tariff. I'm not talking about a carbon duty. I'm not talking about an import duty on the carbon content of fossil fuels and rolled steel and bulk glass. I'm talking about a uniform tariff on all products whatsoever placed on non-members of the coalition. And when you even, which is what is in Professor Nordhaus's proposal, otherwise he doesn't get the participation that he wants. When you mention that to international negotiators, they go apoplectic because that's over, from their perspective, that is overthrowing 40 years of building up the international trade regime from where it was. I'm not saying that depending on how it's done, it's legal or illegal or compliant or non-compliant with the WTO, but it, it is a non-starter. It's not going to go anywhere. So uh, beyond Paris, uh, the talks I think were a success, but we're not gonna know about the agreement for many years. Um, but it does provide the opportunity for a new path forward. Um, one key necessary condition has been met, adequate scope of participation, but of course the other key necessary condition is adequate ambition of policies. Paris, however, is only the first step. These are gonna be revisited every five years. And, but the remarkable thing is that even the Paris INDCs are quite significant. 
So remember that 2100 political target of two degrees C? The business as usual prediction, at least from the United Nations, is five to seven degrees C without the Paris Agreement. The Paris INDCs can, I put it in italics because it would mean them being kept in place and fully implemented, can lead to three and a half degrees C. And the Montreal Protocol, because of a path-breaking change of view by the country of India, uh, it looks like it's now going to include HFCs, which are not only uh, under the protocol because of stratospheric ozone depletion, but are a greenhouse gas. Uh, that can shave off another half of degree, bring it to, get to three. That's not two but it's quite impressive for what is the first of a five-year uh, period of ongoing. So in the years to come, the major locus of international cooperation may continue to be what I've spent most of my time talking about, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It might, may be other existing venues like the G20, or maybe it will be climate clubs. But what, what I want to emphasize is that with any of those venues going forward, the importance of carbon pricing and the importance of linkage across countries absolutely remain. So that's my attempt to, I hope, demonstrate that an economic perspective and environmental economics is not oxymoronic, that it can be helpful, if not essential, for a full understanding of environmental problems, and therefore solutions that are environmentally effective, rather than just giving limp service to a problem or being symbolically uh, valuable, that they actually do something about the problem, that are economically sensible, that is cost effective, and therefore politically pragmatic. I apologize for having uh, gone very quickly. I'm trying to emulate one, a, a great uh, MIT professor, Jim Paterba, um, who I, I've always thought of as the fastest talking professor in the world. So I, I aspire to uh, his model to get there someday. So I went through it quickly. For more information, here are all the websites, the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements, the Harvard Environmental Economics Program, my own website, uh, where everything I've written since kindergarten is available as a PDF file, uh, my blog, and as they now say, or my kids would say, you can follow me on Twitter. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we have time for just two or three questions. Yes, in the middle. I just want to say that was a phenomenally lucid presentation. Um, thank you. That's and fantastic. I'll say it twice. That was a phenomenally lucid presentation. Thank you. You can say it three times. <laughs> <laughs> you made my day. Okay, thank you. Great. We like those kinds of questions. Uh, right here in the front. I also learned a lot from your lucid presentation. I wanted to know regarding the INDCs. Can you give us some insight into what was the motivation of countries to give substantial INDCs rather than just very limited ones and serve as like free riders to the agreement? Right, so I think there, there, there are a variety of motivations. I'd say the two most important is that in some cases there are correlated or what people call co-benefits of reducing CO2. In so many countries reducing CO2 really means reducing use of coal and in China, and for that matter in India, where there are severe localized air pollution problems, there is an ancillary benefit that's very much a benefit locally, economically in the broad sense of economically in terms of human health and perhaps also politically. That said, also for the United States, the Obama administration clean power plan, which is this the most important part of the US INDC calculation. Um, I did some uh, numerical estimates of that, and 94% uh, of the estimated benefits uh, for the United States of the, C of the clean power plan are in terms of reduction of particulates, not climate change benefits. So that's one, is the, the correlated pollutants. The other is what, the, is what political scientists refer to as naming and shaming, is that when you're making it all public, uh, then countries care about their position in the world. And in the case of China, that becomes, I think, particularly important. You know, we, in this country, we like to say, um, the, that the 20th century was the American century in which this country emerged into the world leader that it, it became during that century. And many people in China anticipate or at least hope that this is going to be, that the 21st century will be the Chinese century. And if, you're, if it's your century, you don't obstruct. You're not a laggard, you lead. And I think that's part of the uh, motivation in China. Great, right here. Oh, hi. Uh, that was a really good talk. I just had a quick question. Can you comment on uh, economic models, if anything's available, uh, that would measure the impact of uh, impact of the climate change policies on countries' economics as such? Like, 
Uh, are there when anything you say, in place? When you say comment on, do you mean, should I describe methodologically the nature of the models, or do you mean the results? Well, a bit of both. Okay, so they're basically the models that, so they're, they're the models that are used for aggregate calculations of damages of climate change by economists are a combination of CGE models, computable general equilibrium models, together with the natural science part of the modeling in terms of emissions leading to certain concentrations, leading to certain climate change, and then from that going into the economic modeling. So that's the nature of it. They're highly aggregate. They're not certainly very accurate or useful at a small geographic uh, disaggregation. So for example, the, one of the most important climate impacts in the United States would be ir irrigated, economically would be irrigated agriculture, dryland agriculture in the western United States, much of which is, is fed by the Colorado River, uh, snowpack. And uh, of two models, one of them says the Colorado River snow, the river flow will increase, and one says it'll decrease. So you have orders not just on magnitude, but on on, on sign. The f constituents of what go into those models themselves come from a whole set of you know, different economic methodologies. And if you took my environmental economics class at Harvard, um, then we'd talk about those. Or I can sell you a book. <laughs> I can vouch for it. It's a great class. We have one more question coming from the back row. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on, uh, from the US perspective, uh, how important is it to have uh, continuity in the executive branch? Because you said that it was, uh, these agreements were made to not be ratified by the Senate because that was a problem in the past and would certainly be a problem today. Um, and I guess it looks like there'll be con probably continuity uh, in 2016, but you know, 2020 it's, and the scope of the length of these agreements is not very far off. And so uh, is the US policy likely to be disrupted if there's just a, a change in the party that's con controlling the executive branch? So uh, I, I met this morning, actually, with a, an unnamed uh, <coughs> high official from, uh, from China, from the uh, NDRC, which is the key uh, body in China on this issue and many other economic issues. Um, <clears throat> and we were scheduled to meet for a half hour. It, it took the first 20 minutes for me to get away from his questions about Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> so, uh, which we laugh about now, but we may not be laughing. Um, and so there is massive concern. There's massive concern in Europe about that. There's huge concern in China and many parts of the world. Climate change is the least of the concerns. We go through a litany of all the others, particularly for China, international trade uh, in general. Uh, so there is concern about it. That's why there is a push, but it's not going to work. There was a push to try to get um, the enough countries, 55 percent of emissions from 55 countries, ratifying it before inauguration day in the US. Because once that happens, it comes into force. And given the nature of the agreement itself, what it says is that if you're going to drop out of the agreement, you have to give two years notice. And then the process of being removed takes another year after that. In other words, it would just occupy the entire next administration. However, and, and China and the United States will do it this year. Um, because in the U.S. it's done through, you know, executive authority. It's not going to be ratified. Uh, and in China is a centralized economy and, and government, and they'll just decide, and they're going to do it um, in time for a uh, G20 meeting in September, probably. Um, but that's 40 percent. In order to get up to the 55 percent, um, you need a few small countries, and you need Europe. And unfortunately, in Europe, the requirement for ratification of an international agreement that the EU is a party to is not only a vote from the European Parliament. There must first be a vote by the Parliament, successfully, of every member state. And even if there was support from Poland and Eastern Europe, for whom it will be quite, you know, quite costly because of dependence on coal, just the, the, to get through that process is such that uh, no one anticipates, no one, I think, believes that we'll be likely to see that happen in time. So it's a, it's a risk. So it's just one of many reasons why the next election is very important. But I want to say I'm bipartisan. I'm not for any candidate. <laughs> so uh, on a lighter note, uh, Rob Stevens is also, I understand, the editor of the Journal of Wine Economics. That's true. Yeah. And so we've prepared a reception for you at oh. which you can uh, continue to ask your questions and continue the discussion. For now, please join me in thanking Professor Robert Stevens. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I want to say two things. One is that because I went on so long, there wasn't much time for questions. But if you come to the reception, I'll stay as long as anyone has questions. And the other is that if you would like to be on the distribution list for the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements, we don't inundate you. You get materials. I'm sure you're on it. Like It's like once a month or so. Um, just give me a business card if you have one or your email address on a slip of paper, and you'll be tied in. So again, thank you. Great. And thanks to Mighty for organizing.